Is this on? Is that right? Yeah, not, yeah, 9,000 lines. Because when we get over to the space shuttle, that's only probably about 700,000 lines of code. 700, yeah, 700,000, because that's 1 million right over there to the right. So the Mars Curiosity rover has, holy crap, yeah, right, I mean, that's probably 2, 4 million lines of code right there. 4 million lines of code, yeah. And then you get over to Google Chrome, which is closer to 9 million, yes. And then a Boeing 787 is more like about 20 million? Boy, that's something you'll think of. That'll be tight, but yeah, that's going to be super million. Well, it's not as terrifying as the fact that Mac OS X 10.4 is about 19 million lines of code. And a Ford F-150 in 2016 appears to me to have about more than 100 million lines of code. That's ridiculous. How can an F-150 have 100 million lines of code? Wow. Yeah, right. That, that, I don't know. That's, that's right. It's pushing it. It's getting close. Or is it quarters of megabytes? story here that we covered recently. Uh, in February, researchers uh, at an Israeli university showed that they could get, get data out of a compromised computer by using the light that shows whether the hard drive is working to send those right. data to a watching drone. So you don't actually need electrical connection, you just need a visual connection. It, it was slow, but it could work. So, ouch. Now, here, here's that bit that I promised you about early internet. All of these programs sit on top of older technologies that are often based on ways of thinking which date back to a time when security was barely a concern at all. This is particularly true of the internet, which a tool, originally a tool whereby academics shared research data. The first versions of the internet were policed mostly by consensus and etiquette, including a strong presumption against use for commercial gain, for commercial gain, sorry. So, Actually. when Vint Cerf, I hope I have his name right, one of the internet's pioneers talked about building encryption into it in the 1970s, he says his efforts were blocked by America's spies who saw cryptography as a weapon for nation states. Boy, the world would be a different place if that had been, um, you know, baked in from the beginning. That's 45 years ago, 47, 40 years ago or so. Wow. So thus, rather than becoming secure from the beginning, the net needs an additional layer, a, a layer of additional software, half a million lines long, to keep things like credit card details safe. New vulnerabilities and weaknesses in that layer are reported every year. I, I really like the way the economist has done this. You don't, do not need any technical expertise to follow what they're saying. I was about to say that you don't need to know what TLS is or certificates or any of it. Just, you just understand that, like, there are layers and each layer adds a risk. Yeah, we know exactly what they're saying. Yes. We, we know they're talking about SSL. Open SSL. Yeah, exactly. Is that what you figured they're talking about? I did, yes. Okay. So. Another example that they gave, uh, a database belonging to Spiral Toys, a firm that sells internet-connected teddy bears through which toddlers send messages to their parents, lay unprotected online for several days towards the end of 2016, allowing personal details and toddlers' messages to be retrieved. Oh, 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 I think The Economist listens to TechSnap. Oh, I think so, too. You're probably right. Hello, dear friends of The Economist. Very careful. Send me a subscription. Exactly, yes. On top of the effects of technology and culture, there's a third fundamental cause of insecurity, the economic incentives of the computer business. Internet businesses, in particular, value growth above everything else. And if you've ever worked at a startup, that's exactly what they value, and that's exactly what the venture capitalists want. They want to see you growing, growing, growing. They're looking at the money at the end, and yeah. That's exactly how technical debt and other problems just end up happening. Yes. Ship it on Tuesday, fix the security problems next week, maybe. I encounter that on a regular basis. And if you all do, unfortunately, it's hard to I mean, like, essentially, like, you know, ultimately, most development gets done at companies that are businesses that are obligated to make money. And so I can understand what happens, but it's, it's, it's something we all need to work on to make sure that the, you know, the repercussions of the potential liabilities are built into that, into the economic side. I don't suppose you've ever worked somewhere where there was somebody like a rock star was working and they could do no wrong and what they said went, regardless of what the other people said in terms of this is wrong, it's a mistake. And someone that doesn't know any better says, well, just do it his way because he's been so good in the past. Right. And a lot of times those are people that, you know, it's like, they, you know, that's, that's what they can make the feature. They got the thing that the sales reps needed to market the product to the customer next week. But that doesn't mean that it was necessarily the best thing. Doesn't mean it's going to scale. Doesn't mean it's going to work. It just means that it worked for the demo. <laughs> Amen. So. Going back, uh, I'm skipping over a section where they start talking about uh, liability. We've all read end user license agreements, or at least the accept button. Yeah, we claimed to read them. There's. It's all legalese, and it's all there because someone gets sued. But the lack of legal, legal recourse when a product proves vulnerable represents a significant cost to users. If customers find it hard to exert pressures on pressure on companies through the courts, you might expect governments to step in. But Dr. Anderson points out that they suffer from contradictory incentives. Sometimes they want computer security to be strong because hacking endangers both their systems and their own operations. On the other hand, computers are espionage and surveillance tools and easier to use as such if they are not completely secure. To this end, the NSA is widely believed to have built deliberate weaknesses into some of its favored encryption technologies. No, they wouldn't have done that, would they? Really? That sounds immoral. Could it be? Then who? The risk is that anyone who discovers these weaknesses can do the same. We've covered that many times. In 2004, someone, no authority has said who, spent months listening on the mobile phone calls of the upper echelons of the Greek government, including the Prime Minister, by subverting surveillance capabilities built into the kit Ericsson had supplied to Vodafone, the pertinent, pertinent network operator. And we, we said, if you provide a backdoor, someone unauthorized is going to use it. No doubt at all. Yep. You, can't, you can't have a master key without risk, right? No master keys. So, in terms of uh, security, Google and Amazon are developing their own versions of standard encryption protocols, rewriting from top to bottom the code that keeps credit card details and other tempting items secure. Amazon's version has been released as an open, on an open source basis, letting all comers look at the source code and suggest improvements. Then they come to very two great sentences. Open source projects provide, in principle, a broad base of criticism and improvement. The approach only works well, though, if it attracts and retains a committed community of developers. Right, that is key. Yep. So much software has 
languished and died because people lost interest. People will lose interest over time, but I mean, people as a group lose interest in maintaining it. Right. It's natural for you know, dictatorship to change from person to person, time, all of that. But what is key is that the community understands that the project is necessary and that people want the project in a state that's possible for this to happen and then two, that people can carry that stewardship forward and improve things. Um, uh, I forget who it was who declared that uh, a, 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 great, a great open source project is one that has gone through many regime changes, regime or governance changes, um, basically because they can evolve and, and exist without a core network. Right. Yeah. Just changes over. It's yeah. big enough group. I think that's one of the good things about the FreeBSD project is how, the, how, that's, how that's maintained, how flexible it is. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to say. Well, then that's what I did. Thank you. So, one of the things that Robert's been working on, and I've, I've heard him talk about this, uh, uh, he's been working on, on security for a while. Dr. Watson has been using this agency's money to design Cherry, C-H-E-R-I, a new kind of chip that attempts to bake security into the hardware rather than software. One feature, he says, is that the chip manages its memory in a way that ensures data cannot be mistaken for instructions, thus defanging an entire category of vulnerabilities. We talked briefly about Stack Overflow. That wouldn't be possible with this. Cherry also lets individual programs and even bits of programs run inside secure sandboxes, which limit their ability to affect other parts of the machine. So even if attackers obtain access to one part of the system, they cannot break out the rest. We can have a web browser where every part of a page, every image, every ad, the text, and so on, all run in their own little secure enclave, says Dr. Watson. His team's innovations, he believes, could be added fairly easily to the chips designed by ARM and Intel that power phones and laptops. That's almost, it's like taking Chrome one separate, because each, each, each tab in Chrome is a separate entity, is it not? You can kill them off and not worry about it? Yes, each one is a, is a separate process. If you do a, you know, your, your PDF, you'll, you'll see, like, oh, yeah, there's like a thousand quotes running. I know, I see that. Uh, Firefox has made, made uh, some strides there as well as in their rollout of electrolysis, as they call it. So they're, they're both working on it. Now, DARPA. DARPA is where the internet really started. They're the ones that said, hey, create a, uh, a network where if you take away nodes, it still works. And that's where um, TCP IP came from. Or was that Ethernet or DARPANET? DARPANET was the first one, and then Ethernet came out of that. My memory is foggy here. So another DARPA project focuses on a technique called formal methods, and, and this is where I remember proving that, that code did what it said. So one of the things they were able to do, they developed formally verified flight control software for a hobbyist drone. A team of attackers, despite being given full access to the drone source code, proved unable to find their way in. That's a significant thing, because that's software for flight. So this is in 2013. I imagine they'll be able to do a much better job now. Yes, that's another area I'm talking about. Uh, Amazon has their own new SSL application, S2N. Uh, Amazon's been pretty involved in the formal verification space as well. Uh, so it's, it's interesting area. Uh, try to prove software practice, especially with the Google by things, you know, state machines or other constructs. You can about and, and I like that. I like that a lot, yeah. <coughs> so this brings us on to one of the very last things that we're going to cover in this, which is insurance. So you can actually take out cyber insurance, and it's a big market. It's three to four billion dollars a year. And as a cost of insurance amount, companies may start to demand more from the software they're using to protect themselves. And as payouts rise, insurers will demand the software be, to be used properly. But it is the issue of software makers' liability for their products that will prove most contentious. The industry will fight any attempt to impose liability absolutely to the nails, says Mr. Gross. So changing, changing to another uh, quote here. And I do think that that's pretty good. I mean, can you imagine liability for an open source project? It couldn't exist. There's no one, there's no one behind it to accept that. Yes, right. I mean, it would be a dangerous. There shouldn't be, but just... Well, like my SQL, you, my SQL, you've got Oracle. Yeah. Postgres, you have literally nothing. Yeah, you've got an open source project, you've got people who have committed, but you don't have, there's no, there's no legal entity to even say, hey, yeah. okay. That scares some people, but I don't see why. We can sue someone if it goes wrong. Well, if you sue someone because it went wrong and your business tanks, well, you're stupid. Yes, exactly. You have to design that into your process, into your architecture, as well as I think that, that that's one area where I see open source pairing well with consultants, it's where you can, you can then have firms that can do, you know, security analysis that can give you a little bit of hedge your, hedge your bets or at least have something to, you know, know that you're in a good place and you can have people help you build up the systems that you use that open source technology properly. Now, to, to dodge any feedback about me using the word stupid, what I'm getting at is you sh your business shouldn't fail because of a single piece of software failing. There's a whole lot of stuff that you're using and you hire the good people that know how to do the right thing and you should be fine. Um, you, that's what disaster recovery plans are for. Um, but no, I, I can't see open source projects providing liability insurance. I just can't see it going there, not at all. And I think it's, I mean, it's dangerous in the sense of, not that it's a bad thing, but like in many other areas, um, that might stifle, you know, if you start expecting those things, then you need a lot of capital, you need a lot of things to, to have that in place, which might then stifle the, company, the number of companies that are able or, or projects that are able to play in that space. It's a barrier to entry. Exactly, yes, very well said. That's exactly what I want. Um, Last bit here, Kenneth White, a cryptography researcher in Washington, D.C., warns that if the government comes down too hard, the software business may end up looking like the pharmaceutical industry, where tough, ubiquitous regulation is one, of the is one reason why the cost of developing a new drug is now close to a billion dollars. There is, then, a powerful incentive to the industry to clean up its act before the government cleans it up for it. Too many, too many more years like 2016, and that opportunity will vanish like the contents of a hacked bank account. I like The Economist. I really do. That was so good. No, I, think that's, I think that's right. I think that's a, it's a great summary, especially for laypersons, people who yes. aren't concerned with this, people who might not yet watch TechSnap. Yes. Everyone who has relatives is saying, you know, what is this about computer security? Why is it so easy? Get them to read this and then let them ask you questions and get back to us with the questions that they're asking you so we, we see what non-technical people yeah, think about this are. Interesting. Yeah. I think it also highlights just how complex our current stacks are, especially because they're like, I mean, maybe not the Ford F-150, but like a car from 20 years ago, you know, that was perhaps reliable, simple in many ways. Yeah. The internet and the computers, they don't like that. I mean, no, right, no one person can understand an entire computer, let alone even an entire processor or yeah. all the protocols sometimes. And there's no, com there's no computer in those old cars. Yeah, right. They, yeah. Just, they, just, they just ran. We can't they just ran. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, interesting. Well, that's kind of terrifying, but I think it did a good job of highlighting some of the improvements, some of the ways that, well, you know, that we are getting better at it, and hopefully the economic incentives there at the end for companies to embrace it. And I think, you know, more products like this, programs like ours and others, that can highlight, you know, that can make security become part of the product lifestyle, become something that consumers, you know, will use their phone with their wallets to use. That, that's something that we need to see to help. I did my math really in their financial interest to take security seriously. Yes. 
Anything else that you'd goes. like to add to this guy? I'll be interested in any future articles I have about this, because this was a cover story. Oh, interesting. That's great. I, I like that a lot. It was. Uh, well, excellent work. Thank you, The Economist. And thank you, Dayton, for finding this excellent story. If you take security seriously, you probably take a lot of other important aspects secure, seriously as well. And that brings us to our next sponsor this week, which is our friends over at IX Systems. So if you need a new secure NAS for your home office, for work, or you have bigger needs, check out iXSystems.com slash techsnap. What is iX Systems? iX Systems is the hardware provider you wish you heard about years ago. They have an excellent partnership with Intellation, all the latest and greatest Intel processors. They have wonderful partnerships with all the different hardware vendors that you might need, and they build open source, you know, hardware that supports open source on Nash anywhere else. If you're thinking about buying a new server, and you're like, well, I can go to a big box store, I can go online, I can, you know, try to click through some stuff, try to make sure that I understood my needs, how many IOPS do I need, what kind of connectivity, oh, but I need to make sure I have, you know, this many PCIe expansion slots, and it has to fit and fit in my 2U rack mount. That is exactly the place where IX Systems is your perfect partner. IX Systems has a team of talented sales engineers, so just give them a call. Don't, I mean, go browse their website, check out their blog, they have tons of interesting stuff, they're awesome community members, but just give them a call, start a conversation, start a dialogue with IX Systems, and they will be, you'll find some people who are fascinated by technology, fascinated by open source, who understand security, understand servers, understand, understand the whole life cycle, and are going to be excited to work with you to design a secure, modern system to meet your workflow. Plus, IX Systems, you know, you'll find them at conferences, they are super involved in the OpenCFS product, project, they work with, they are responsible for the FreeNAS project, as well as True OS, so they understand open source, they've been around for many years, they understand the kind of workloads, plus they have a ton of great sponsors. If you go to iXSystems.com slash you'll find one, a great, a great guy for buying hardware for open source technologies, but regardless of your needs, go to iXSystems.com slash techsnap, check a look, take a look at some of the people that they work with, right? Like LinkedIn, Groupon, Splunk, Tumblr, Hitachi, they have some of the biggest names here, petabytes of storage, They're, they are masters at these big data solutions but not big data prices. That's the thing, I have systems, because they view things holistically, they want to work with you to understand exactly what you're doing. They don't want to oversell you. That's one of their interests. What they want to do is form a partnership so that you can trust them and they can trust you and you have real people that you can trust. You know, when you work with IX, no matter your size, whether you're a giant company or a government agency or just a mom and pop small business, they treat you first rate. They want to make sure that you get the server that's, that, you know, that works for you, that fits for you in a way that you understand, right? So make sure that it has the software you need, it's configured right, has a full support system, Everything you know, that's right there on the website, storage servers and solutions. Solutions is really where iSystems excels. They want to work with you. They want to make sure that you get the hardware you need, the configuration you need, the awesome Intel processor that you need, the security that you need. It'll all come ready to go, just what you want. Don't waste any time. Go to iXSystems.com slash techsnap. And thank you to iXSystems. <clears throat> I was just reading that PDF about the um, yeah, that's a great tap, PDF. Tap, tapping. Um, there have been some security fixes done. In fact, oh, wow. iOS 9.3 from March a year ago. <clears throat> Safari took similar countermeasures by suspending the availability of this motion and orientation data when the web view was hidden. See, that seems like a very reasonable start, right? I mean, if the tabs don't open, if I'm not interacting with it right now, yeah. it shouldn't have access to those APIs. You can't get access to it. Yeah. So. I think that's, right. you know, that, that's a great thing. It's a long-standing problem, and how we how we solve the problem of accessibility, ease of use, not having to click through a thousand things just to get the website to work, but maintaining our security. I think it's an open issue, something we'll have to keep covering on the show. Yep. And on the show, in the past week, we had more feedback than we have in any other show. Ooh, so either people are happy with us or exactly the opposite. There, there were no complaints. Hey, okay. They, were, they, they weren't saying, hey, you did this, you did that. So maybe those people have given up. <laughs> or <laughs> or we, just, we just did nothing wrong. Or we did nothing wrong. I have a hard time believing that. But I'll take so, it. So there were requests for deep dives on Postgres, uh, DNS, ZFS, and Jails. Ooh. And I, I went and I brought up this book from years ago. Nice. I'll look at the crowd. That's great. I know how old it is because it's got the old street address that I lived in in, in Wellington, Zone. So I know it's at least so-and-so, but it, it's pre-2000. And one. Wow, oh, that's great. That's like a relic now. This one, the printing history goes to 98, so I probably brought it in 99 or something. Right. And I don't know where I was when I bought it, but this is the book that I read to figure out how networking worked and how DNS. Um, really, DNS is, I learned from here. Oh, I found some uh, highlighter in here. I'll have to find it. Where to go? But I recommend if you're new to networking or doing your own DNS, anything like that, if you want to learn about ne networking, anything to do with TCP, IP, read this. Yeah. There's also a, a basic, it used to be called the Red Book. Yeah, right. Systems Administration. Read that as well. It's a very good book. I think, especially so, with networking, like you really need to have your mental model of what's happening correct so that you can then, you know, not every situation or every network configuration is going to be described in the book. But if you have that, then you can actually start reasoning about the systems you're really going to interact with. Like TCP, IP over a serial line, not many people need to do yeah, that. Right. Sir. But if you understand the fundamentals, you can. Yeah. So it goes into um, send mail and debugging TCP, IP and stuff like that. But basically, I, I, I would read it uh, if you're starting out. I would read up on the network services, DNS, and network servers, and just see how those go. Um, but the Systems Administration Handbook, which I thought I had, you have to only, maybe only. I was, I was looking for a different book here. I don't remember what it was, and I found this one. But anyway, um, read that book, get started. But in the meantime, I want to talk about Postgres. Just oh. do a brief overview of Postgres, because it is Postgres, Michael, and FreeBSD are my three most right. favorite things. We've talked about a fair bit about it, but kind of only hinted at it before. You know, we've, mentioned, we've done a little feedback questions, but yeah, but it has never been a topic on the main part of this program. No. So oh, we're not going to get too. we're not going to get really deep. This is just sort of when you do start using Postgres, you'll remember this talk and say, oh yeah, I remember this. I remember this. I won't seem as scary. Um, my my first encounter was with Postgres was when someone said, hey, listen, you should have a look at Postgres. It has the stuff you need because it was it was 2000. I was living in New Zealand. I was working on Fresh Ports, the website Fresh Ports, and I was designing the, the database that went behind it. Because you, you think it's not very complex, but it is very complex. Uh, if someone wants to find the Fresh Ports uh, data model, it's huge. It started off as just four or five entities, but now it's it's huge. I have to have a tool to keep track of it. Oh, yikes. Well. Um, but I, I know I stated before that I, was, I, I came from a background of uh, big professional databases like DB2, right. um, uh, I can Sybase, can't think of any of the others. But I was using them, and when I started using MySQL, which was the database of choice back in the late 90s, um, I started playing around with it and said, oh, it doesn't have relational integrity, or oh, it doesn't have certain procedures, or, oh, I can't create a function. Oh, that's what a null date looks like, and stuff like that. So 
someone said, try Postgres, and I tried it, and I had the stuff that I wanted. It's a database I recommend. Um, I just, it's very solid, it's very reliable, and it treats your data very, very well. And I think a big, a big component for me has always been that it's, you know, it, it, it takes ACID seriously, it's, it's standards compliant, um, MySQL has not always been so great on some of those things, so it's nice to have an open source database that really is first class. It, MySQL is improving? Yes, so, sorry, you, you, no. I, I, I use it. Yeah, sure. That's not, not, not my database of choice. I also, for me, um, a lot of like the JSONB stuff in, in Postgres, like a lot of times where, uh, you know, if, a lot of times Postgres can, can be your NoSQL database or other type of applications where you don't you know, you have one database, one code base that you understand, your administrators, administrators already know I can have a diverse piece of your application. Um, and I use it for just about everything, like uh, the websites that I have, like BCCAN, PGCon, the database behind that is Postgres. Um, I, I would use it on my WordPress sites, but I think we covered that recently. WordPress doesn't really support Postgres right. anymore. Um, now, I included my, my year 2000. Uh, original blog post, and as I was scrolling through it earlier today, I actually noticed that I updated it later that year to do backups. And then in 2001, I started talking about upgrades, uh, upgrading from 703 to 713. And then in 2002, I talked about uh, improving performance, and that was interesting because that performance was minuscule compared to what I was talking about, like going from six, a six, 600 millisecond query to a 0.6 millisecond query. Wow. And that was wonderful. But it's interesting to see how, how much it's changed over the years. Um, the default super user um, it used to be PG SQL, and now it's Postgres. That only recently changed. Right. Um, so, what can I say about Postgres? It, it's a it's a traditional client server bit. Um, you can talk directly to it uh, if you're on localhost through, through um, a lo localhost socket. You don't have to go, go through TCP IP. Or if you're coming in from another machine, you can go over SSL. It's easily um, enabled. In fact, I'm supposed to be doing that this afternoon. I'm sorry, but I got sidetracked. Um, when, after you install it, you have the concept of, of, of the data directory, which is data dear all in cap, cap letters, and that's an environment variable that is often used. Um, the first thing you have to do is initialize the database, which is basically you give a template zero, template one, and I always forget which one's which. One is, one is in, uh, immutable, you can't change it ever because it's what it uses for to create new databases. But the other one you can change and add your own, own things to it. Now, I don't recommend you do that, that's really advanced, don't do it, I'm just saying. Uh, other things you can do is you can say, create me a new database based on this database, and that's an advanced feature too. But, okay, so forget about that. So you do the init DB, and then you start the database server, and then it's up and running, and you can connect to it through the command line utility called PSQL. P PSQL? Yes. And you, it should just connect on localhost if you got it listening on localhost. Um, but if you become the Postgres user, which is like a or older versions on previous or Postgres, then you can just issue commands. Um, there are command line utilities uh, like create user all one word or create DB uh, that will allow you to create, create users that connect, can connect in and then create databases. It, it has a similar concept to traditional Unix where you can create a group and add permissions to that group and then add people to that group. So, um, for example, today I was allowed, creating a group which allowed uh, you to connect to this one database and read from this one table, and that's all you can do. You can do anything else. Um, so uh, that's done in within the database itself with commands such as uh, create user or create role. Role is sort of like a group. And you can create a user and add them into a group or a role. And then if things change and you need to add more permissions to everyone in that group, you modify the role, not the person, not the user. So the users will have various roles that they can perform. Um, and that's like a, I think that's just one of the many ways where you know, it's battle tested, right? Like those are kind of like the maintainability things where you don't want to be having to update a whole bunch of users' manual permissions to make sure that you, know, you separate someone from the company. You know, if you have roles, you can be like, all right, this is that class of users. 